In this video we understand chapter 2nd Kings and Kingdoms. Here we cover 1. Emergence of new dynasties 2. Administration in the kingdoms 3. Prosperities and land grants 4. Warfare for wealth 5. A closer look The Cholas Let's start 1. Emergence of new dynasties In the 7th century Different regions of the Indian subcontinent had powerful landlords and warrior chiefs. Existing kings considered these landlords their subordinates, called Samantas. Samantas had to offer gifts, attend the king's court, and provide military support. As Samantas gained wealth and power, they declared themselves as important rulers, sometimes even asserting independence. An example is the Rashtrakutas in the Deccan, who initially served the Chalukyas but later became independent. 2. Administration in the Kingdoms New kings adopted grand titles like Maharaja Adhirja and Tribhuvana Chakravartin. They collected resources mainly from peasants, traders, and artisans through taxes and rent. These resources funded the king's establishment, temple and fort construction, and wars. Revenue collectors and army positions were often held by close relatives of the king. Some kings, like the Cholas, imposed numerous types of taxes, including forced labor and land revenue. 3. Prosperities and Land Grants Prosperities were texts that depicted rulers as valiant and victorious. Often composed by Brahmanas, Kings rewarded Brahmanas with land grants, recorded on copper plates. In contrast, Kalhana, who wrote a history of Kashmir, was more critical of rulers. Many rulers boasted about their achievements in prosperities. 4. Warfare for Wealth Rulers fought for control over important cities like Kanauj, leading to a tripartite struggle. Some rulers targeted wealthy temples during conflicts. Mahmud of Ghazni raided the subcontinent multiple times for religious motives. Chahamanas, Chauhans, tried to expand their control, and Prithviraja III had a notable victory and defeat. 5. A Closer Look The Cholas, Cholas rose to power in South India, expanding their kingdom to include Pandyang and Pallava territories. Rajaraja I and Rajendra I were powerful Chola rulers who even invaded other regions, including Southeast Asia, Chola temples. Like those in Thanjavur and Gangaikonda Cholapuram, were architectural marvels. Temples served as centers of craft production and economic, social, and cultural life. Agriculture and Irrigation The Cholas achievements relied on advancements in agriculture, particularly rice cultivation. Irrigation was essential, with methods like well digging and tank construction. The Delta region required embankments to prevent flooding. Rich peasants played a vital role in the administration and agricultural development. Administration of the Empire Settlements of peasants called, a uh, became prosperous with irrigation. Villagers formed larger units called, Nadu. Village councils and Nadu had administrative functions, including tax collection and justice. Rich landowners received titles and held important offices under the Chola kings. Brahmanas received land grants and formed assemblies to manage them. Associations of traders occasionally performed administrative roles in towns. Inscriptions and texts, Uttaramarur inscriptions detailed membership criteria for the Sabha, Council. The Sabha had committees for various functions, and members were chosen through a lottery system. Different types of land and their purposes were mentioned in Chola inscriptions. Types of land Chola inscriptions mentioned different categories of land, including those for peasants, brahmanas, schools, temples, and Jaina institutions. A glimpse of ordinary life. An excerpt from Puranam provided insight into the lives of ordinary people, such as Pulayas, 
who were considered outcasts. It described their simple lifestyles, including agriculture and daily activities. These chapter provide a glimpse into the emergence of new dynasties, their administration, economic activities, and societal aspects during this historical period.